Cool. Okay. Thank you very much for that um, introduction. So today I'm talking about some work that I started. That it's kind of like an early stage project in my PhD that I've come back to kind of revisit <laughs> and finish off. Now that I'm no longer based in Oxford, I'm now in Philadelphia working with Lauren Salan at the University of Pennsylvania. But first I'd like to thank all of those that made this work possible, all the people that allowed me access to museum specimens, of course some people in Oxford like Graham Lloyd, Roger Benson and Laura Sowell. So, as my title suggested, any journey to Telios supremacy must mean that they're pretty supreme in some way today, and I think this figure helps to illustrate that quite nicely. They represent over half of all vertebrate diversity and pretty much everything you would consider a fish. But it's not just that they're taxonomically rich, they also show this really broad morphological variety. Everything on this slide is some sort of flavor of Telios. Now this really starts to beg the question of why Telios are so diverse and what is the pattern by which they became so dominant in the recent. And it turns out this is a pretty classic question, not just in fish paleontology or paleontology, but evolutionary theory. This is from Origin, where Darwin says, the case most frequently insisted on by paleontologists of the apparently sudden appearance of a whole group of species is that of the Teleostean fishes low down in the chalk period. So the idea at this time was that it originally quite a sudden appearance of Teleos in the chalk period in the late Cretaceous. So sudden that some saw it as a threat to Darwin's theory. How can you get this huge group just showing up all at once? And this really goes back to Louis Agassiz's work. So in his seminal work on fishes, this is the first diagram ever of this kind in the literature, showing groups through time. And as you can see, things, there's a lot of, of these lines go to the recent, pretty much all of those are teleos, and you can see they all tend to spring up in the cray, which is the, the chalk. So this is where the idea of this sudden appearance comes from. Darwin did talk about uh, early fishes, teleos fishes, a few teleos fishes from the Mesozoic, but the narrative is very much that there's this really quite sudden appearance, and they're not that ecologically important before that time. And this quite fits in quite nicely with other classic literature that talks about a sort of golden age of Holosteans earlier in the Mesozoic, in the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the early Cretaceous. And that seems quite odd, because the Holosteans today, they're the sister group of Teleos, but there's only seven, uh, sorry, eight species of them. You've got one bowfin, seven gars, restricted to the freshwaters of eastern North America. But in the Mesozoic, you see a staggering variety of morphologies of Holosteans. They were clearly much more interesting in the past. You find them all over the globe from a range of depositional environments. So all of this really feeds into a classic tale of these two faunas. You have this dominant Holostean fauna for most of the Mesozoic that sort of ruled the waves for 150 million years before this sudden rise of Teleos in the upper Cretaceous. But how accurate is this pattern? If we, if we use my new data set to have a look at this. Now, the taxonomic patterns aren't the main focus of my talk, but just as a bit of context, I thought it would be nice to look at that as well. So here is the sort of classic textbook pattern of diversification. And if you just do species counts for comparable bins, just so you can compare them like for like, you clearly get a quite different pattern in the, uh, with the new data. So there clearly is this sort of period of Holostean dominance, but it's nowhere near as spectacular as in this previous account. Um, also, the Teleos, they arise quite early, and you see things quite early in the Triassic, the first Teleos, nowhere near as late as in previous accounts. Furthermore, the Holosteans are actually quite, their, their diversity stays pretty much, pretty quite flat throughout this whole entire period, apart from this spike due to like Solnhofen and Sarin. And then the Teleos overtake them by the late Jurassic and hold that position until the present day. But again, that isn't really the main focus of my talk, this taxonomic pattern. So I was really more interested in the sort of phenotypic rise of the Teleos fishes. And so I had one shape data set as well to look at this. And if you look at disparity with those shape data set, this is the sort of pattern you get for the Triassic. You can see that Teleos, the bottom line, they, they barely register in the early and middle Triassic. But once you get to the late Triassic, they're doing something more. But actually, Holosteans seem to be more disparate throughout this entire time period. The Triassic, I can show you why it's a little bit strange, why you have such broad confidence intervals on Teleos disparity, because they've, they've pretty much got two morphologies. They're split between this sort of generic, boring fish-looking thing on the, this side and this sort of deep-bodied pycnodont thing over here. But you can see that Holosteans seem to be doing actually more. They show a nice spread throughout the space. So we head into the early and middle Jurassic, you can see that Holosteans still remain on top. We're very much in the golden age. But by the late Jurassic, 
there's this teleos takeover, there's this switch. And what happens is they maintain this higher disparity throughout the early Cretaceous. <coughs> now, I also looked at a functional data set, and that shows a very comparable sort of pattern. Again, there's some broad confidence intervals down the <coughs> beginning part for teleos, but Holosteins are doing very well into the sort of lower middle Jurassic, and then it kind of starts to switch her over and teleos take over. But one question to ask is, is that this pattern, this phenotypic pattern, actually robust if we remove some of those sort of major lager statin uh, throughout this time period? And so here's just the shape data set. I'm just focusing on that for now. And if you pull out those major lager statin, this is what you end up with. So it's quite reassuring. It doesn't seem to have changed the sort of major patterns going on here. But there are some interesting differences. If you remove something like Lyme Regis, you pretty much remove everything we know about fish diversification at that time. So it's actually probably more useful to retain it, because then you still have numbers quite comparable to your surrounding bins. In the late Jurassic, you do weaken evidence of that takeover when you remove Sonhofen and Sarim, but it's still quite there. The average teleos disparity is still higher than you get the maximum confidence interval for Holosteans. You actually strengthen that sort of divide between Holosteans and teleos when you remove those lager statin in earlier parts of the early Cretaceous. And then in the Albion, the very last bin of this series, you kind of remove that sort of increase in disparity at the end there. And you get a very similar picture for function. But generally speaking, the patterns that I showed you before, the general thing about the takeover is quite robust to removing those Lagerstatin. <coughs> but this does raise the question of what we should do with Lagerstatin in these sorts of analyses. This is, a, this is Solnhof and so these sort of exceptional sites like this. Should we remove them completely from these sorts of analyses? Anybody who likes working on pterosaurs might like the idea of removing Solnhof and giving that this is some flavor of stem telios chowing down on this pterosaur. But maybe we need to think out better ways of modeling these, these lager statin into our analyses. So things about, and maybe distinguish between sites that are exceptionally preserved compared to those that seem to be like centers of biodiversity, like Solnhof and might be a sort of coral reef environment. Anyway, so we have this sort of pattern that seems to be robust. But what's driving this takeover? Why the late Jurassic? What's going on? Is it to do with the appearance of crown group teleos? These are the ones with duplicate genomes, the ones that the sort of biologists tend to rave about. They appear in the late Jurassic, and then they continue to diversify. Is this the driving force? It's not just stuff from the literature that's, that kind of suggests this crown teleos might be important. In my own work, looking at evolutionary rates, you can tell that you know, the blue will be low rates and red will be high rates, and you tend to see higher rates of shape change in the crown teleos. Oh, I can see that I've left it in review, that it's no longer in review, sadly. <laughs> Back in prep, I'm afraid. So, <laughs> um, so there's reason to believe that these crown teleos are actually could be driving this pattern. So I'm going to look at that again with the shape data set. I'm going to focus upon this time period where that, you go from that immediate middle to late Jurassic. And if we just focus on this time period, I'm now going to dissect that red teleos curve into the stem teleos and crown teleos component. So we look at the crown teleos, they're going to be in green. Again, there are no crown teleos in the middle Jurassic, so that's why there is no disparity. What about in the late Jurassic? Barely registering at all. They're not very disparate when they first appear. That, they're clearly not driving this pattern in isolation. And then if we look at the rest of the time period here, they're, about, they're quite similar to Holosteans. In one bin, they're a bit more disparate than Holosteans. But again, they're not driving this pattern totally in isolation. What about the stem teleos? We plot those in orange. You can see there's a sharp increase in their disparity between the middle and late Jurassic. And they actually maintain very high disparity throughout this time period. But just because those crown teleos aren't actually very disparate within themselves, it doesn't mean that they're not really important, potentially, in helping teleos as a whole overtake Holosteans, because even if they're quite boring within themselves, if they do something quite different to all the other stem teleos, they could actually contribute a lot to overall disparity. So to look at that, we can just plot out some of these things in the morpher space. So we look at stem teleos here. They've got quite a nice spread. And what they do is they, certain clades tend to anchor down quite extreme period parts of the morpher space, and they sort of retain that space throughout most of these time bins. That's why you're getting these quite broad complement intervals, but quite high disparity. If we plot on those crown teleos as green dots, you can see actually they're not doing stuff very different to the stem teleos when they first appear, but they do show a greater spread as they go through time. So the ultimate test here would be to look at partial disparity 
So if I just focus again on looking at that red curve and saying, how much does stem telios actually explain that red curve versus crown telios? We can just put that as a sort of percentage, looking at partial disparity. And you can see that in the middle of Jurassic, again, when there are no crown telios, they explain 100% of that disparity, of course. Once the crown telios show up, they, very, they do actually explain very little of the disparity. So stem telios are responsible for that initial telios takeover. And as you move out through the early Cretaceous, crown telios do actually start to represent more of that disparity. It becomes about 50-50. So that's what's going on. So just to sum up, really, the Holosteans are clearly much more diverse in the past than they are today. There is this Holostean golden age of sorts, but it isn't quite as impressive as in those classic accounts. But it's still a good 50, 60, 70 million years long. And that's, a, that's the length of time, and it takes 100 million years for Telios to actually overtake them in the late Jurassic. That makes a sort of completion of this Telios takeover tentatively in richness, but definitely in sort of phenotypic traits. Furthermore, it is not the crown Telios that drives that initial takeover. In fact, it's the stem Telios, and the fact that you accumulate through time this sort of critical mass of interesting morphologies that by the late Jurassic give you that much higher disparity. And they continue to be a really important force in Telios disparity well into the Cretaceous. They actually go up to the um, Cretaceous boundary, then many of them are hit by the extinction. Some of them even hold on, the pycnodonts hold on. So I hope you get the impression from all of this that actually Telios were an ecologically important force deeper in Earth's history, much earlier than the sort of the chalk period of Agassiz suggested. Thank you all very much for listening. <laughs>